Hey, with Alice Mump, um, longtime resident of Andover, who recently moved to Manchester to discuss some early events in her lifetime as a, they relate to Andover. One of the first things we were going to discuss was uh, the whole topic of home birthing and home remedies and medicine of the early 1900s and so forth. I guess you weren't born in Andover, right, because of some events that happened with a home birth prior to that. Well, maybe what you have to say at the very beginning is, when was I born? <laughs> and although I resent having to tell you, uh, I think it's important as a base in terms of what I remember mm -hmm. and what time. And actually, if I will have a birthday this month, and I was born on May 31st, 1909. Which is always easy for us to remember because it's my father's birthday a few years later. Yes. Yes, that's right. And uh, at that time, my father had the one son, my older brother, John Gilman. But this was my mother's second pregnancy. And she had lost her first child with her always believing it was because uh, there was not adequate medical care promptly available. And the result was that, as far as I can figure out, I was the first child in the Yeomans family that was ever born in a hospital. And of course, uh, the nearest, most available hospital in those days was, I guess it was St. Joseph's Hospital in Willimantic because that was before the Wyndham Hospital. And uh, I always had a little uncomfortable feeling that I was the only child of the Yeomans family that was born in Willimantic. And that didn't seem quite right. I mean, John was born in Andover, and the younger siblings were born in Hartford Hospital. So I was always a little reluctant, I don't know why, to say I was born in Willimantic, but that's what my first book says, so I guess that's correct. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, things were very different then. And one thing I was thinking about, so many things were not discussed in the early 1900s and, and somewhat later. For instance, it was a disgrace if anybody in the family had mental illness or if they had TB or cancer. It was never mentioned, and it was whispered about. Well, the result was that along with secrecy on those things, the fact that a woman was pregnant was never, never discussed. And I can recall as a child my mother sending me out of the room because she had something she wanted to discuss with Mrs. Phelps. Well, a few months later, Mrs. Phelps <laughs> had John help, <laughs> so I always assumed that was what that whispering was about, because I knew nothing of it otherwise. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is I've wondered sometimes if John knew there was a pregnancy in the family, he would have been going on six. But I have a hunch nobody told him until it happened. Mm -hmm. And my next youngest sister, Ruth, was born three years after I was. And I know I was not told. It was a matter of confidentiality. And when my father came home on the train one day from Hartford, I did know that a day or two before mother had gone into Hartford, I assumed to visit my grandparents. When my father came home, he said, you never guess what your mother has. And I said, what? And he said, a baby sister. I don't think I was overjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly was surprised. However, when the next two children came, also born in Hartford, when he came home and said, guess what your mother had? I was an old-timer then. And I said, why, she had a baby, I suppose. 
I suppose the clothing at the time pretty much helped hide the fact that oh, it was absolutely. Right anyways. And you never saw one of your parents without their clothes on. Mm -hmm. Just nudity was unheard of in those days. <laughs> well, along with that, though, but there were still lots of women having children at home in Andover at the time. Oh, going yes. to the hospital that's was why, not the norm. Uh, see, mother had some nurses training. So when someone locally had a baby, she was often summoned to help out. As I'm sure she was summoned to the Phelpses, and and the next uh, birth of a child in Andover, I remember, was Martha Bartlett. And at that time, the Bartlets lived. I guess it was the old Bissell Post place, wasn't it? Yes, it was. On Cider Mill Road. And I know in the middle of the night she was called and summoned to the Bartlets, which was quite a surprise. Were there women that were necessarily designated midwives, quote unquote? Uh, not that I know of, but there was <coughs> what we called, I guess, a practical nurse in town. And when there was illness or a new baby that some help was with, she was always called. And that was Julia Perkins. And Julia was a long time Andover resident. Did you ever get Elisha Perkins? And over history. I think the only Perkins I really know is that the halfway house was owned by a Perkins Yeah, well, for a it's, while. An old, it's an old Andover family. And Julia was one of the exceptional people who had never married. In those days, there were very few old maids. And Julia was one of them. And she lived in the house where the Hoisingtons had lived for a good many years there. And if we ever go into much later history, there's quite a tale about Fourth of July and Julia Perkins. But we can save that for another day. Okay. So um, as children were growing, though, there were also a lot of folk, folk medicine that went on and so forth, and well, castor oil and, and things like that, that. You see, my mother was a city girl. She actually was born in England but she lived in Hartford. And as I said before, she had some nurses training. So my grandmother, who lived with us when I was very young, had definite ideas about what medication and so on children should have. And my mother was a radical and would have none of that if she could avoid it. For one thing, in those days, castor oil and cured most any ailment. And my father and mother would not allow us to take castor oil. Uh, later on, when everybody was taking, what was it, cod liver oil, she couldn't see any sense to that. And those were mostly given as a maintenance almost medicine, not as a specific cure for any specific illness. Well, uh, one thing my grandmother believed in, and I can just remember trying it once or twice, was pussy willow tea. <laughs> and in the spring, somehow, people frequently were run down. Well, I guess if they had winters like we had this year, mm -hmm. you can understand why they were run down. Well, anyhow, uh, pussy willow tea was to strengthen you in the spring. And there were a couple other things like that that were supposed to uh, vitalize you when spring came. Uh, the pussy willow tea was quite bitter. And another uh, thing that my grandmother made for medicinal purposes only was dandelion wine. That was pretty good. Did you ever try it? No, I have never tried it. She was a strict teetotaler, but she made dandelion wine. Was at this point in time, uh, within your recollection, and over dry or wet, or was we flopping back and forth? I know throughout the history we, we flopped back and forth quite a bit. I don't recall anything outstanding about the weather in those days. We always looked forward to winter so we could go sliding and that sort of thing. But uh, I don't remember any astounding things when I was a child. 
Okay, what I was really referring to was the liquor, whether you're a wet town or a dry town. Oh, that's kind of wet or dry. I wondered, I thought you meant weather, and I wondered <laughs> why you thought of that. Oh, well, of course, the, uh, in my recollection, no. Uh, I think they were all dry towns, theoretically, weren't they then? Uh, Andover flipped back and forth a lot of times. I'm, I'm not recalling a date as to when it would have been wet or dry. Well, That's why was, I was asking. Uh, there was, of course, I sometimes get mixed up with the stories my father used to tell and what really happened <laughs> in my day. But one of these was what we call the Porter's House, where Frankie Brown lives. You see how many towns intersected. Andover Center. You know. The beehive for yeah, a year or two, depending on the time. There. Well, in the basement of, call it Porter House, or whatever, what was that house originally? Do you know? It wasn't a Porter House. Was that in the Hindi or the Hutchinson House? Well, anyway, <laughs> rumor had it that in the basement there was a movable bar. That was the Hutchinson House. And if the revenuers came to check, and they knew they were coming from one town, they quickly moved the bar over to the other town, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. Now, I do not know if that was true or not, but the odds are it is, because uh, I guess my father was pretty accurate in his tales. Yeah. Back to the early childhood and stuff, um, dressing of children was somewhat different than Boys wore dresses as well as girls and things. And even the uh, the winter clothing, I understood that some of them used to wear literally newspapers inside their clothes. And well, I think that was a rare exception. Okay. But uh, it's true that personal hygiene was not uh, paid much attention to. <laughs> In fact, some people thought it was terrible. My mother wanted us to take baths more than once a week. Saturday night, literally, you took a bath. Now, we were one of the two houses in town that had a bathroom. There were several that had running water, but we, I don't know if anybody else had a bathtub. You know that. I don't, no, I don't. I don't know that either. But anyway, you were supposed to take baths Saturday night. Now, my father, I think, always did, but in between, you washed your feet and wore clean socks, usually. Good. <laughs> but you didn't, uh, you didn't do the laundry as often, that's for sure. And when I was growing up, we always had someone that either came in and did the washing and the next day the ironing, or else we took it to somebody to wash and, and iron. What you can imagine was five children. It was mm -hmm. quite a bit. But, the clothes we were were very different. I have a picture of myself when I was maybe two years old, or almost two years old, year and a half anyway. And I'm in full, what'd you say, baby's dresses. And, uh, you know, long dress and fancy. Quite formal looking. For yeah, me. and uh, that was not uncommon. I mean, I wasn't dressed up for a special occasion. And of course, uh, the girls wore dresses. In fact, it was some years later when, again, my mother pioneered in letting her daughters wear bloomers. We had dresses with bloomers before <laughs> it became common. But I think even more striking was how they brought up little boys. And you've seen those pictures of your grandfather. Mm -hmm. He must have been, what, five or six? And he was still wearing a white dress. Yep. And of course, the other thing with little boys, even my mother had a little problem with this. They like to let the little boy's hair grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's an early picture of David blonde curls, but uh, he didn't keep his curls too long, and I remember my mother practically crying over it that David had lost his lovely <laughs> curls. And of course,
course, the saddest part was David was the only one in the family that had beautiful blonde curls. We curled, didn't have much curl in our hair. And that didn't seem fair, because nobody had ever heard of a permanent. You know what they used? Curling irons that they heated over a lamp with a glass chimney. Mm -hmm. Now how the Dickens they did it, but I remember watching it. And you put it down and you must have had to hold it. I think so. But why more houses didn't burn down, I don't know. <laughs> because of course we didn't have electricity until 1926, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there were a lot of things like that that were different. And how little girls wore their hair. Mostly it was pulled back and with braids. But I think we, we never had really long hair as young children. We always had what they called a Dutch haircut, which was kind of chopped off all around. Certainly and all the huge pictures of bow in the front. Yeah. And my father never liked those huge bows. Because when he'd come home from work after supper, always the youngest child would get up in his lap and he would read to us. Well, the first thing he would do would say to the child, why does your mother insist on putting that bow in your hair? And he would take it off before he would read. <laughs> Which again, I guess that was popular for quite a while. There's a lot of pictures I've seen certainly have it. It, were there any other ways that the house in the center, or living in the center, not necessarily the house, made you different or unique from well, the I general thought, populace? Well, I thought it was very terrible to not have a farm. At that time, which I would say is, uh, what, through the 1920s, Andover was primarily a farming community. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was terrible that we didn't have a horse, and we didn't have chickens. We didn't have anything. I guess finally in desperation, my family let us have white rabbits occasionally. But we only could have one white rabbit, and it was always named Peter. <laughs> and quite often it escaped, and I can see my parents running through the orchard back of the house trying to catch the rabbit. I guess they finally caught it. We always had cats. Mm -hmm. Cats were a very important part of the Yeoman's family. I don't think my mother was that crazy about them, but <laughs> my grandmother was, and of course my father. And it was later on that we were able to finally have one pet, which was a dog. And that was kind of over Daddy's great protestations, but somebody gave it to us, so <laughs> we had a dog named Bill. I won't go into Bill at this, at this point. Uh, but that was part of the problem with being at the center, because the answer I always got was, we didn't have room for animals. Well, we probably had two acres or more, didn't we? Uh, at the onset, yes, probably. We had the lots next door and so forth. Which, of course, got ruined when they built that two-and-a-half-story house, which my brother John saw in the Sears Roebuck. And it was one of the first prefabricated houses, we recall. Mm -hmm. huh. And the rumor had it that Mr. Smith, who was the local carpenter, never survived building that house because he couldn't make the stairway fit right. And shortly after that, he had a heart attack and died. Mm -hmm. Blame the house. How did the house arrive via train, or did they truck yeah, it out? It came on a train. train. Yeah. Most everything arrived everything on the train. train. Well, of course, living at the center. The reason my family lived at the center is because my grandfather, Myron. who decided to be an attorney, a lawyer, uh, didn't much care about horses, and of course didn't really have one of his own, though he lived on the farm in Columbia. So he moved to Andover, as close to the railroad station as he could get, and he boarded with a lady there at Andover Center, where he could get the train. 
Well, later, and I don't know just how much later, he bought the house. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that we all lived in until, what, 1956. Um, you were also very close to the school by living right in the center there, just up the <laughs> hill. Well, that was uh, a great thing. I assume that's one reason we all were so eager to go to school. Are children usually eager to go to school now? I don't know. I think some are, and some are, some just are. like through all of history. Well, anyway, I could hardly wait to be old enough to go to school. And I started in, in the first grade when I was five years old. And even though I had long to go, and of course my brother John, was still there. But the day I got to school, here I knew Miss Bradley, the teacher, because she boarded across the street at Mrs. Webster's, where she boarded for I don't know how many years, 20 odd. And of course I knew her because I'd see her walking up every day. And I I don't know that I'd ever really visited the school, but it was right there, and I used to long to play out in the, back the schoolyard with the other kids, but I wasn't supposed to go across the wall and play with them. And anyhow, when the big day finally came, I was all dressed up in a new dress, and I think Brother John took me by the hand and took me to school. Then he left because he would have been Mr. in the other room, Bradley. right? He was in the big room, the big room. And I was in the little room. Well, I was obviously one of the littlest of the little room because there would have been four, four grades there. Mm -hmm. So we all were assigned a desk, and I guess I had a new pencil box, and I don't know what. But anyway, here I was, and I looked around, and it was kind of a strange, overwhelming, itself um, and what a furnace in the basement that had oh, just open grates to oh the sure heat the heat was a great big old furnace that was a when was that building built because that must have been a relatively new school 1903 well sure it was only 10 less than 10 years old so mm -hmm. it had modern conveniences like this big old thing that the older boys were sent down to put wood in during the day and it had registers on the floor of the two rooms. And sometimes the boys would giggle when the teacher to get warm would stand over the register and her skirts would fly up a little. And that was before Marilyn Monroe came along too. But you talk uh, about modern conveniences, but there was still no electricity, there was no indoor plumbing, no, and an outhouse. No, there was a uh, faucet in the basement that usually had water, couldn't get water out of it. Where did that water come from? I would guess Taylor Pond. I think it would be too high to have come off the hill like your house, but I, I was unaware of that, so I don't know where it would come from. I know they well, Somehow I have a feeling it was a, from across the road back of Phelps's, but I don't know that. Yeah, there's a small pond there. Well, if not, it came all the way from Taylor Pond, where the that's where the railroad station got its water from. And of course, uh, there was no indoor plumbing. And again, there were two outhouses, one for boys and one for girls. And I used to say to my mother, I don't know why I have to come home to go to the bathroom. Why can't I go there? <laughs> but she didn't think that was a good idea. So I. <laughs> I don't know how that finally came out. But of course,
course, an interesting thing about a, a two-room school, uh, it means there are practically four grades in one room, which is quite a task for the teacher. But there are some good things about it because, uh, well, certainly I learned to read very quickly in the first grade mm -hmm. at the age of five because other kids, older kids, were reading. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wanted to do it too. And uh, so from that standpoint, it was good. But also, by the time we got to the big room, classes weren't very evenly done, and I think I skipped a grade twice because they were consolidating uh, the classes. And I know when we graduated from that grammar school, there were eight of us in the graduating class, and that was the biggest so number that they big ever had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, like well, Nate Gatchel started the first grade the same day I did. And of course, we went through the grammar school together and then also through high school. But there were many things different about it, certainly. Uh, Miss Bradley maintained good discipline by the fact that she had a rubber hose in her desk drawer. Well, I always visioned it as a pretty big rubber hose, but I think one day she did take it out to threaten with it, and it was just a little. <laughs> but anyway, I guess she, it would hurt a little if you smashed so. it. But that was the thing, don't let her get the rubber hose. She was a very strict teacher. She right. had, you had but I take it from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like she had much of a problem, either her no, reputation or whatever. No, I she did. Occasionally, well, did you, did you ever know the Hunt family? Alfred Hunt no, really. was the bad boy of the class. And we'd all get upset when Alfred got in trouble, because rumor had it that she had used the hose a couple times on Alfred, mm -hmm. which very likely was, was true. And it was long before uh, school lunches or anything of that kind. Well, what did you do for lunch? You bring your own or did kids well, go home? Well, if anybody or? lived near enough to school, they must have had an hour's lunch. Okay. Like Miss Bradley always went back to Mrs. Webster's. And Sybil Jennings, I think, lived for a time at Bass's, so she would have. And Hazel Carey lived. Um, How did the kids but, generally get to school in the first place? Did they walked. They all walked, no matter how far away they were. They didn't there was no transportation whatsoever. And parents didn't bring them on a wagon or anything Well, like that. I, I can vaguely remember in the winter time, there was somebody that lived a long way away whose family had one of those big, it was a working sleigh. Hmm. And they'd kind of stop along the way and let the kids get on. I thought, gee, that would have been nice, but <laughs> I, of course, had to, had to walk up. But that was a pretty long walk for some of the children. Mm -hmm. What would be the furthest? Well, of course, Lindholm's. And out the Hebron Road, a pretty long way. Well, do you know roughly what the, when the school day started? It was like when 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? Oh, I think 9 o'clock. So it wasn't like they had to get up at 4 or 5 in the morning and start walking if well, they had an hour or two walk. And they had to carry their lunch. I don't think we had much homework in those days. Maybe the upper grades, but I don't recall. Of course, I probably never did much any of it. <laughs> but I don't recall homework, which you had to carry your lunch. Well, you know, that's why the older people can say, you don't know what it's like to go through these difficult times. They didn't seem too difficult then. <laughs> Well, what else was going on around the center at that time? You had a couple of stores and, uh, let's see, the hotel. You well, remember the hotel it burning. burned before I was too old. I'm trying to think how old I was. It was what 1916 year was that it burned, so you were seven, yeah. six, seven. Yeah. Well, I remember my mother or somebody getting me up out of bed to 
go and sit by the window because we could see it burn. And then the next day, uh, some of us rode our bicycles around there. And were, you know, it was a terrible thing because I think there were three men, weren't there? Were there three or four? The four, guy, I believe. Four. One was Mabel Duchamp's husband. And we all knew Mabel. The story goes she refused to identify his body because she was so mad at him in the first place. So. He shouldn't have been up there playing cards That's anyway. Right. That's right. <laughs> Aside from bringing most everything to Andover, it was also the major way people got in and out of Andover, pretty much, wasn't it? Did you oh, yes. travel around much? Or? And of course, uh, that's interesting. They used to go to Willimantic to go shopping Thursday nights. You know, the stores were open Thursday nights in those days. And it was a big thing to go to Willimantic shopping on Thursday nights. And, uh, the trains. And then there was one gentleman in town who always came back on the very last train out of Willimantic at night. And rumor had it that sometimes they had to help him off. I've heard roll him out. <laughs> <laughs> but that went on, I guess, for, for quite a while, unfortunately. I don't know what became of him. He had a wonderful tenor voice. Oh yes, was it was when, uh, when I must have been in about the fifth grade. I was in the big room because uh, towards the middle of the day, I don't remember the exact time, but we were all in school, a train was at the station that kept blowing its whistle over and over. And Miss Carey, who was the teacher in that room, said, well, I guess somebody better go down to the station and find out what is going on. And it's a little confusing who went. But Charlie Phelps said he did, and maybe he did. I was going to say Roscoe went. But anyway, a couple of the boys went to the station, and they found out that the armistice had been declared. And they came the running back up the hill, puffing and saying, the war's over, the war's over. Well, it was almost over, wasn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, was this the real armistice, the false armistice? That they, they but that was our only way of direct communication. And an interesting thing, uh, even though we had a telephone, and there again, not too many people in town had telephones, but most of them, I guess, mm -hmm. did. And uh, so in some respects, we could get some news from Central, the, the operator of the telephone, was that, I think. Well, that was run out of Willamette, wasn't it? I guess so. And, uh, of 
course, you could get a lot of local news from the telephone because we were all on party lines, and all you had to do was listen to <laughs> what was going on. And sometimes you'd have to say, would you please hang up the phone? I can't hear so well when you're on the line. <laughs> oh, well, funny how you can remember things. I can even, I can even remember telephone numbers from those days. And go back to medical care in the early days. We had wonderful home visits from Dr. Higgins, who lived in uh, Coventry. And I can tell you now that when my mother went to the phone and called 496 ring 13, we knew that Dr. Higgins would soon be on the way. <laughs> but I can remember probably half a dozen was he pretty much the doctor of choice for Andover? I think we didn't have a doctor in town, but I know he's, he's who delivered my grandfather and helped out with my grandfather's I mother and so I forth. I suppose so, yeah. No, I don't, the only other doctors were in Willimantic. And some people went on the train to doctors in Willimantic. And of course we had a dentist that we went to. Though actually with my father going to Hartford, we had dentists and some doctors uh, in Hartford, but Dr. Higgins was the one that came. I don't think, yeah, there was one of the Willimantic doctors that came. And strangely enough, at that period, there was one woman doctor in uh, Willimantic, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Laura, I forget what her other name was. And some people in town went to Dr. Laura, but she rarely made home visit, but Dr. Higgins did, you know. He was the one that later went to the legislature and to Congress, and his byline was, get Connecticut out of the mud. <laughs> and that was when streets were, roads were not paved. And actually, there's a Leonel Higgins Memorial Highway in Coventry to this day. What is it? Route 31, I guess. Okay, that's news to me. I never well, recalled I that. that was, uh, back to the center for a second. What were the stores like at that point? Obviously, we didn't have refrigeration and things like that. Were no, that's right. We got sack of that dry goods and like post something different, or were they competitors pretty much across the board? Or? Well, <coughs> as you know, because there's that very good book about it, Everything Happens for the Best, has some wonderful descriptions of the Rosenblum store in the former creamery. And I'm trying to think what other stores were there when the Rosenblums came. Well, is Sackett still operating at that point, or it already closed down? I think he was still operating, but I was wondering when that other store... Post must have been still operating, or under some name anyways, I don't know. Post well, they had different kind of stores. Uh, as I remember, Post Store, it started because the uh, post office was there. By the way, do you know if the post office was ever in our house at the center? I think... No. If it was, it was only in transition until it was in the building across the street there. Yeah. Well, I, I can't remember. It wasn't in my day. It would have been before. Well, anyway, I can vaguely remember when the post office was in the store up across from the firehouse. It was called the post store. Yeah. And uh, they had the post office, and then because Emma Keeney, who worked with Lucius Post, who ran the post office, and it was found that Emma Keeney was inclined to read other people's mail, that they got a new building for the post office, which was further down the road. But it was a fascinating store, because I think it had a few groceries, like barrels of flour and barrels of sugar. But it also, in the back, had a shoe department. And you'd go there to buy shoes, and especially rubbers and overshoes, as I remember. And the Sackett store that 
was across the street firehouse specialized more in milk products. So I don't know if they sold milk in the store then, but they sold butter and they sold cheese. And I can remember Mr. Sackett cutting a great big round of, of cheese. And you'd go and tell Mr. Sackett you wanted about so much and he cut it off for you. And of course he also had where she sold ribbons. And that was a beautiful store to go to because they had every width, kind, color of ribbons. <laughs> now, how they could have had a whole business on ribbons, I don't know. But they did. But I believe also she sold some corsets. And you could go up there for a fitting on a corset. But I was too young.
Were there any others? Not that I was aware. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you, whether there was anybody other than Rosenblum selling either gasoline or even coal or anything like that, things like that. Well, you see, the terrible thing about the gasoline was that people would run out of gasoline at 11 o'clock at night and would come and pound on our door. <laughs> and one time my father got so angry, you know, those big things that a notary public has to yep. make the stamp, they're pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. One time my father got so mad at this man, he grabbed that and said to the man through the door, you get out of here and you're not going to have any gas tonight. <laughs> and I think the man thought he really was going <laughs> to get him with that and he departed. Well, I don't know how long this went on, but it was a great annoyance to my mother for betting reasons, one of which was every night after supper, my father had to go over there and balance the books or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last postmasters who also tried to run the store were Helen Gatchel, who didn't do very well. I guess the store was about gone then. But Helen Jewett and Clara Thompson kept the store, except when our family filled in any <laughs> What time is it, Scott? 10.30. 10.30. What time did you get here? Nine. And uh, she was five years older than I. Almost six years older. She was, what, a few months younger than your grandfather. So I must have been uh, 17. Florida and stuff? Or oh, yeah, she went to Florida with the family. I know she went once. I kind of think she went twice. I think she went I just don't remember seeing her in any of the photographs. Of that. I always see the, yeah. the four children and the yeah. mother, but I never see Well, she was there yeah. one year I was there, and I think she was also there one year I wasn't there. Now, if you want something unusual about our family, well, there were two things, but it wasn't unusual that you had a hired girl. The Gatchels had Daisy, who was quite a something. Do you ever hear about Daisy? I don't think so. <laughs> well, there was a lot of good gossip in those days, too. <laughs> and uh, there was Daisy, and then uh, the Burks. Do you ever know who the Burks were? with some of the city people that came to Andover. And I think this is important to get in at some time in your history, that before the lake, Andover was a summer resort from people from Hartford who came out by train. And I knew a lot of those families. Well, 
Was it because of the train, or was there some other draw to Andover just that we were well, out convenient to get there? These were city people, and either you went, if you had later, when we had more cars and better transportation, they all had shore places, places at the shore. Mm -hmm. But I think it was because it was a short ride from Hartford, because some of them had cars. And they all, not at the very beginning, but they had uh, transportation by the, uh, the train. And I can remember the Phillipses had a car and a chauffeur would drive up to the railroad station to bring Mr. Phillips out or something like that. But it was it went on for a number of years, and I don't know if you ever found out about the typhoid epidemic that was in the Parker Stearns place. I've heard of her referred to as a typhoid Mary. center for a minute. I got a few more questions there. Um, like there was also a blacksmith shop that oh, heavens, yes. weren't supposed to hang around. And <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go there. But that I, was right down on the brook. Right? Yeah, that was Ned Merritt's blacksmith shop. Okay. And uh, of course I did go there occasionally. Do you ever go to a blacksmith shop? Only the ones at like Sturbridge Village and things. Well, this was a real honest to goodness one. And uh, it's fascinating to watch a blacksmith and the bellows and how they get that fire going. Mm -hmm. And then how the heck they keep the horses, well, they had to hold them down. But to watch them mold that iron is, is an amazing thing. And I guess Ned was a pretty good blacksmith as far as I know. Uh, he was the character. later, when your grandfather got into a Fourth of July incident, and several comments were made that they never had any idea that John Yeomans knew so much profanity. <laughs> and someone else said, well, he should have. He used to spend a lot of time at Ned Merritt's blacksmith shop. But I could never understand why my mother Seated Rosenblum, so that would have been prior to just prior to their arrival. But there oh, was I also think one the up at Post, must they? put that in. But across from Aunt Dorothea's house was a little building that was the pool hall. It was almost like up on stilts, wasn't it? Hanging out. Yeah. The Is there any mark of it there now? I haven't seen any mark. I have seen a photograph of it. That's why I know well, it was up happened? on stilts. Well, I don't think it lasted too long. But I think it was Ray Parrish. You know Ray Parrish? No. Well, he was Pearl McDonald's husband. Mm -hmm. And you know where the McDonald's live? Yep. Well, the parish has built a house just further on down the road. Okay. Well, anyway, Ray Parrish is the one I believe that 
erected that building and ran it as a pool parlor. And all I recall is sometimes it was on a summer's night, it was a little noisy there. I was just going to ask, was pool a respectable game at that point in time? Well, more or less, but again, it was for men only. And then later it closed. I don't know what happened. Maybe whoever was at the Rosenblum's bought the pool table. I can't imagine there would have been two in town. This pool well, she table. mentions in her book that her father wanted oh, the pool I table remember. out of there. Was yeah, I remember there was a pool table there. Well, anyway, then at some later point, there was a barber that took over the pool okay. business. And I don't know how long he was there, and I don't know what happened to the building, do you? Not a clue. Well, I, it was probably there a relatively short time. What building? The but another thing that was important at the center, so-called, well, there were two other things. We've mentioned the depot, but then there was the library at one end of town, and uh, the town hall mm -hmm. further down. And a great deal, in fact, all of the town's recreation, except maybe baseball, was at the town hall. Wasn't and it was the Grange, for one thing. Well, what about the Baptist church across the street that the town bought and used for well, basketball? Well, that was a so very forth. brief period. Mm -hmm. I can vaguely remember when they stopped having church at the Baptist church. I can remember it slightly because the Sprague's were Baptists. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's his name? William B. Sprague had a Surrey with the French on top. And there were three of those, I think, in town. And two of them went to the Congregational Church, but William B. Sprague drove his with lovely horses. He had very nice horses to the Baptist Church. Well, then the Baptist Church just sat there for a long while, and for a very brief period, uh, they organized a boys club or something like that, and they mm -hmm. put in basketball things. I don't even know when that was. Couldn't have been long before. Well, they tore it down in 1932. Well, it couldn't have been long before it was torn down. Why'd they tear it? Who tore it down? Why'd they do that? When we got dilapidated, I've never really seen, and this was, that's the date on the back of a photograph is when it was taken down. And of course it had all those horse stalls and everything there too, you know. Mm -hmm. Too bad none of those were saved, isn't it? Well, anyway. Well, what kind of things went on at the town hall then? Did they have dances oh, regularly? Oh, what did go on at the town hall? Uh, and, which reminds me, I gave you some false information. I told you that Mary Lindholm, whatever her name is, Booth, had, written, had written a history of the Grange, mm -hmm. uh, a history of the town of the Grange. What did I tell you? The yes, Grange. Did. That was incorrect. She wrote, and you should get it, a history of the town hall. Okay. And she wrote it for that time. They had some kind of centennial observance or something of the town hall. I think that was when Anne Rhinelander was first trying to get the town hall to be a uh, historical landmark, and you know, she was all for... Yeah, in 1993 they did the celebration down yeah. there and so forth. All right. Well, ask Mary Boudreaux. Our, the library should have a copy of it. I can certainly no. check. Huh? I can check. But I went through some of their stuff, but I didn't notice it. But, uh, but Mary's history was primarily the town hall, but it was a good... See, her father built it. That's why she had a special interest in it. He was the town carpenter, more or less, Mr. Lindholm. Well, anyhow, my first recollection of the town hall, maybe it's World War One, and they had entertainments there to raise money for war bonds or something. Mm -hmm. And my sister Ruth was 
five years old. And she got up on the stage at the town hall and she sang over there. <laughs> what did I do? I don't know. I'm sure I did something. You participated though. You're I'm sure I did something. But anyway, all the entertainments took place in the town hall and actually it had a pretty good stage and it had a wonderful floor. The floor was for dancing. And the first dances I ever read, went to were there were square dances. And some of the old timers were really pretty darn good. Like uh,
my sister Ruth, of course, did extremely well, and she took uh, lessons for many years in art and so on, until one day she decided not to do it anymore, which was typical of Ruth. They put on a lot of dinners and things as well at these? Oh, my, yes. They had grain suppers and church suppers, and the greatest was the Girls' League. Did you ever hear of the Girls' yes, League? Yes, You've got those old minutes someplace there, I saw. I don't know about books. minutes, but I've certainly seen little booklets well, that sure describe Well, I'm sure I things. gave some of them to the Peggy Talbot for the Historical Society years ago. Try to track them down. Then. That's right. There's some somewhere. And Greer and Stanley and Marion Stanley were two of the founders. And it was the Hamilton girls and Dorothy Cook and Evelyn White. And later I got old enough to be part of the girls and it was a great joy when I got old enough to wait on cable at the <laughs> church suppers. And uh, of course the food was wonderful. You usually had ham and potato salad and coleslaw and baked beans and assorted pies and cakes and Parker House rolls. And were these things fairly well attended? Did oh, most people from the went town arrive? Yeah, everybody. Oh, certainly. And and the Grange suppers were occasionally open to the public. They were good, too. Well, anyway, the Grange used the town hall all the time. I mean, nobody could use it, I guess, Monday nights. And they, it was a secret organization, so they pulled all the shades down. And Nate Gatchell and I and probably a couple others a couple times went on Monday evening to try to pry open, so but we could never see anything that looked very interesting, though they had some funny stands up on the stage. But anyhow, you had to be 12 years old to join the Grange, and both Agnes and John joined the Grange. So I could hardly wait till I was 12 and could join. By the time I got to be 12 years old, I had discovered there were other interests But it lasted until this year, didn't it? Uh, last year, I believe, yes. They turned over all those funny lecterns and things to the Historical Society. Oh, they did? Yes, they did. Well, that was nice. Well, do ask Mary Lindholm about that. Well, I don't know, Scott. Where where should we go from here? Too much. Right. Uh, well, but, up but up also, road, then. also, while we're on the subject of recreation a little bit, uh, in addition to winter sports like sliding, Bass's Pond was a very important feature in our growing up lives. Uh, it was wonderful, of course there was no Andover Lake then, it was wonderful for skating. And once in a while we'd get a good winter with some real skating. And I have never forgotten one winter that a couple of times not only did all of us kids go, but our parents went skating, and that was so extraordinary. I don't think my father could skate, but my mother could glide around with the best of them, and so could Papa Guy Bartlett, and I think Ford Gatchel, and even Charles Bright. There were all these grown-ups that, you know, they didn't do things yeah, like they that. They were stage for that. And, and it, it was just wonderful, and I, I enjoyed skating. But also, it was important in the summer. Uh, I don't know, the dam was very interesting and the waterfall there and all those little things that went around to those various mills. But then one year, and I've never known who, had a boat, a rowboat on the pond. And once in a while we'd go on a whole day's picnic, Ruth and David and probably Emily and I we'd take our lunch and we could row in that boat. And you know, the pond was much bigger then. Mm -hmm. And you could go through this narrow channel up to the second pond, which was totally strange country to us. We felt we were real explorers. <laughs> and of course, the kids sometimes uh, fished there. You could get bullheads and I don't know what all. I caught a bullhead one time, but I didn't really want it. <laughs> And then the brook that came down 
which was for the grist mill and the cider mill. Now, was there an operating grist mill in your lifetime yes. there? Or? Yes, I remember it vaguely, but I remember all the flour, everything was white all around in the mill. And if you were there when I was working, you might get a little white oh, yeah. too. I, I remember that vaguely, but I do remember seeing it. And Mr. Olds ran it. And then there was the cider mill, and that was wonderful because every year my family must have taken some apples. Now, we had some in the road, but I don't know. Anyway, every year we had a barrel, and I mean a real barrel, not a keg, mm -hmm. of cider. And did you ever see it in the basement of the house at the center? It was a wooden rack where you put the cider barrel. And when you had one every year, you kept pushing it back. And when they ran the Valley Company, they did a good sale of vinegar, which was be in various forms, hard cider and then vinegar. And of course, when we got fresh cider to put it in, very liberally, like in the pictures, we cut those uh, lilies. In fact, uh, Sarah Winston talked about it in her book, how you cut the straws from the, those big day lily things and put them in the bung and sip the cider. And then if you got real daring, you could go back to one of those that was hard cider. But it didn't taste very good. The, the fresh cider was better. Well, anyway, and then later came the uh, pickle factory. And that had such a nice smell when you went by there, the spices and everything. But I think they mostly made dill pickles. That lasted a while. But more than that, as the brook went on down, we children all learned to swim in it. Because down there by, well, before you, you know, that little garage before the cemetery. Well, and back along in there, it was dammed up here and there, and there would be a place deep enough and big enough for children to swim. And I think we all started to learn to swim there. And then, of course, we all went to Florida winters, and that's where we really all became swimmers. Too. Now, was the sawmill still there at that point in time, or that was long no, gone by no. then? The oak tree was still there. Uh, it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Well, you know, it had what we call the swinging bow. Did you ever hear about that? I'm not. Well, not it was a. Mind. It was a beautiful bow that came out like this and then went on, and it was low enough so that you could reach up and pull it down and then get into that almost natural seat. And then you could go up and down. down and up and down. That was wonderful. We spent a lot of time playing over there. And of course, we liked to play in the old cemetery, too. That was fun. I don't know how old is that oak tree. As old as anybody around, I'm sure, and a lot older than most. Um, in the cemetery, do you, I know grandfather used to talk about to become a man, you went out played poker on the tables at midnight. So that was, was that? That's, people really did that? That wasn't just a story? I don't, that, that, I, I don't doubt that some tried it. Probably it wasn't as but much it wasn't fun as, as they thought of. <laughs> but we always enjoyed playing there in the, in the daytime. I don't know. You like to look at the, uh, the inscriptions and in that table. You know, there are several tables there. Mm -hmm. Bingham's Hill, was that pretty much cleared over at the point in time you were young and playing up there in the rocks? Where oh, we used to play up there. David describes how we used to play up there on the ship rock, which was very nice. Sure, and you could stand up there on the ship rock and look across the valley, and you could see uh, the houses on Bunker Hill. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, when Marks and I first moved to the house on Bunker Hill, we could look across the valley, and Bib Gatchel had just built his house, and you could see it. We could see our lights at night, but you'd have no 
no idea now. There's so much. Uh, now that's a, a picture of the house when there weren't such heavy trees and so on. Mm -hmm. And that was done. Well, mm -hmm. keep, the, keep the home fires burning, how we used to sing. And yeah. then was there like an there organized group for the First World War? I know there were lots of organized groups, you know, watches and everything else for the Second World War, but what went on for the First World I War? I don't think there was much of anything that organized. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody that we could come under attack, except didn't they have some submarines in the First World War? Uh, yes. I mean, they had them as early as the Civil War, so they must have had them. Well, I think there was something about a submarine came to New London and my father went down there. I don't know. Does anybody have any history about that? Around you probably find it out. But you did do things to support it, like war bond drives and things like that? Oh, yeah. Or? And uh, believe it or not, it was Woodrow Wilson, you know, that started the League of Nations. I can remember when I was still in grammar school taking a petition thing to school and I tacked it up on the maple trees across from the school entrance and tried to get people to sign up that they were in favor of the League of Nations. So you might not be surprised that my political activity <laughs> began early. See, I would have finished uh, 1925, 1921. I finished the grade school in 1921. So it must have been a year or so after the war when they were working on well, During the war, do you remember, was there, there wasn't any rationing or anything like that brought on by the First World War, was there? Did you recall? No, I can't remember anything. Mm -hmm. I just know, I just know as children, we were supposed to clean our plates because think of 